start by uh, acknowledging that we are gathered here today on the unceded territories of the Coast Salish people. Um, I also want to start by thanking the BCCLA for inviting me to come out here to speak, and I want to apologize. I have a bit of a cough, so I might be a little muffled in my speaking. Um, it's no small task. It's kind of intimidating to speak after some individuals such as uh, Don. I'm pretty sure I've studied his some of the cases that he was counsel on in law school, and. I'll be quoting uh, some commissions that he also participated in. Um, so I'll try, try not to, uh, to be nervous up here. Um, as Charlotte mentioned, uh, my name is also Hassan. And as I was rushing to get here in my car on time, which I didn't, um, I was thinking to myself, and this isn't to make jest of uh, Hassan Yad's situation, but I was thinking to myself about the fact that uh, I don't often get to speak about other people named Hassan, but when I do, they're often, or almost always being extradited, detained, or tortured in some way. And uh, that's sort of the pattern that I'm kind of here to uh, shine light on in my talk. Now, since Don is obviously so much more involved and familiar with uh, Mr. Diab's case and has given such a great in-depth overview of it, what I kind of, kind of want to do and focus more on is a point that he touched upon. Um, I want to contextualize and look at how the case of Hassan Diabs fits into a larger pattern within uh, Canada's post-9-11 history, whereas individuals of Middle Eastern or Muslim descent have been subjugated to arbitrary detention, extradition, public smearing, and outright denial of their basic charter rights and freedoms on the basis of evidence that is faulty or at times uh, non-existent and simply on the basis of racial profiling as well. And I want to engage in this exercise by looking at a, a few um, examples of Canadians of Middle Eastern and Muslim descent who've been subjugated to this process, who've undergone similar treatment to that of Mr. Diab's, although the facts and the exact processes haven't been the same. Um, and in relation to this, I want to step even farther back. And I want to explore how the rising climate of Islamophobia, both within Canada and globally, um, has allowed for the creation of what I would argue a two-tier system of due process, uh, where the evidentiary burden required to detain individuals of Middle Eastern and Muslim descent and to label them as terrorists is of much lower standard than that afforded to Canadians who happen not to be of Middle Eastern and Muslim descent. I'm going to try to do that all in 15 minutes. <laughs> so jumping right into it, I think where it makes most sense to start is um, to begin with the case of Mahar R. Uh, because I think it's one of the first cases post 9-11 which kind of grabbed uh, the Canadian public's attention. And for those of you not familiar with uh, his case, uh, Maharar was a Syrian Canadian who in September of 2002, while on his way home to Canada from a family vacation in Tunis, was detained in, JFK, uh, in New York at JFK Airport. Um, he was questioned, held without charges for nearly two weeks, and uh, eventually deported to Syria, even though he was a Canadian citizen and passport holder. He was detained in Syria for almost a year, during the time during which time he was brutally tortured and interrogated, until he was eventually released to Canada, largely because of the efforts of his wife and the public sort of campaign which she launched to uh, mobilize the Canadian government to get him back to Canada. Um, in 2006, uh, a Canadian commission uh, presided over by Justice Dennis O'Connor would eventually publicly clear uh, Mr. Arar of any links to terrorism, and the Canadian government would eventually um, go on to apologize and further uh, award him with uh, a monetary amount. Ironically, even the Syrian government, the individuals behind his torture, uh, stated that he was completely innocent. Now, although the most disturbing aspect of Mr. Arar's story is the fact that a completely innocent Canadian citizen um, had to endure something as horrifying as being tortured for a year. What's also disturbing, I think, for us as Canadians now, 
um, is the fact that our own law enforcement agencies and government played a role in this horrible ordeal that Mr. Arar had to experience. Um, as the 2006 commission outlined, prior to being detained uh, by U.S. authorities, the RCMP had provided U.S. authorities with inaccurate, again, faulty intelligence that resulted in Mr. Arar being placed on our border watch list, which included the likes of Al-Qaeda terrorist suspects, even though Mr. Arar had no ties to any such organizations and had no prior criminal record. The RCMP Anti-Terrorism Division also violated its own forces existing policies by giving U.S. officials sensitive intelligence data that had not been screened or analyzed for accuracy. Once Mr. Arar was detained um, by U.S. officials in 2002, the report goes on to say it is very likely that U.S. officials relied on faulty RCMP intelligence when it decided to send Mr. Arar to Syria rather than home to Canada. To quote the report directly, the RCMP provided American authorities with information about Mr. Arar which was inaccurate, portrayed him in an unfair fashion, and overstated his importance to the investigation. The report says, referring to the Mountie probe of possible Al-Qaeda terrorists, activities in Ottawa after that September, and there's basically quoting uh, a prior probe there. Hence, Canadian officials played a direct role in Mr. Arar's fate. They provided faulty intelligence information to U.S. officials, knowing that Mr. Arar was facing potential deportation to Syria and, of course, a likelihood of torture. And this was despite the fact that Mr. Arar was a Canadian citizen, had no previous history of being charged of any crimes, including terrorism, and with no substantial evidence that linked him to any sort of terrorist organization. What we've also come to know from the O'Connor report is that while Mr. Arar was being tortured in Syria, Canadian officials engaged in, deliberate public, in a deliberate public smearing campaign that was aimed at damaging the reputation of Mr. Arar and falsely portraying him as an Islamic militant or threat to Canada. The campaign involved leaking false information about Mr. Arar which was extracted from him while he was being tortured in Syria and provided to CSIS uh, to Canadian media outlets, such as CTV. Information that Mr. Arar had admitted, to, this information claimed that Mr. Arar had admitted to training in Al-Qaeda terrorist camps in Afghanistan, even though he had no ties to Afghanistan and had never actually visited those places. And like I said, this was all information that was extracted to him under the duress of torture. So, moving on, um, another case that fits into this sort of disturbing uh, Canadian narrative of racial profiling is that of Abu Sufyan Abdul Razik, uh, a Sudanese-born Canadian dual citizen who, while visiting his ailing uh, mother in Sudan in 2003, was arrested without charge by Sudanese officials, and this would begin, uh, this would mark the beginning of a six-year ordeal for him. What we know about Abu Sufyan's case is as follows. CSIS had been interested in Abu Sufyan since 1999, and perhaps earlier, when he associated with several other Muslim men whose profiles came under suspicion. Following his imprisonment in Sudan, instead of taking immediate action to demand uh, the return of a Canadian citizen, who was being held without charges in a foreign country, the Canadian government instead refused to grant him travel papers and blocked his return to Canada. While imprisoned in Sudan, Abu Sufyan was beaten and tortured by Sudanese officials, and the Canadian government has since admitted in court submissions that two CSIS agents in fact interrogated him while he was being held in Sudanese custody, and as uh, Mr. Uh, Abu Sufyan, as Abu Sufyan himself has gone on to say that these a CSIS agents while interrogating him made statements to him of the like of Sudan would be his Guantanamo or that he would never see the likes of Canada again. After being released in July of 2006 from a Sudanese prison, he would be granted safe haven in a Canadian embassy in Khartoum. But again, Canada refused to issue him a travel document to fly home. Abu Sufyan, who has four children, 
uh, eventually returned to Montreal in June of 2009. That same month, the Federal Court of Canada concluded that based on the internal government documents it had reviewed, it was highly probable that Abdul Razik was detained on the request of CSIS, and that CSIS was complicit in his detention. Again, similar to the case of Maharar, in that all of this was done to an individual who has never been charged with any formal charge of terrorism, or any charge for that matter, and all this was done on faulty intelligence information. Another line of cases which seems to, which seems to have become an almost distant memory within the, uh, the Canadian conscience, or never really a memory to begin with, is, the, is Canada's use of security certificates, which under the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act gave government agents authority to detain suspects indefinitely, without charge, without bail. Uh, individuals detained under security certificates uh, weren't allowed to see, that, see the secret evidence that was being used against them, and neither was their lawyer. A unanimous decision by the Supreme Court of Canada in 2007 uh, declared this unconstitutional, and the security certificate regime was eventually amended. However, this was after producing the deeply troubling cases of five men who have never been charged, yet, although, yet through the dubious use of such security certificates, have spent a combined total of 30 years in prison. Their prison terms are followed by strict house arrest and the constant threat of deportation to countries known for their use of torture. All five of these men were of Middle Eastern and Muslim descent. Muhammad Harakat, Hassan al-Miri, Muhammad Jabala, Muhammad Majoub, as well as Adil Charkawi. None of these men were ever charged under the criminal code with committing terrorism or any other crime. They were detained for an indefinite period of time and they never got to see the evidence that was used to detain them, never given the opportunity to speak to it in fundamental violation of their charter rights and freedoms. And of course, as uh, Don has sort of made clear, Hassan Diab's case fits into this narrative now. It fits into this pattern, whereas we have an individual who's been extradited based on faulty intelligence, faulty evidence, um, and who is being racially profiled. Now, if you haven't already caught on, there seems to be a, a common and disturbing um, theme amongst all these cases. The first theme which I, I would identify is that all of these individuals had some sort of status in Canada. They were either citizens or permanent residents, but they were never deemed Canadian enough to be afforded the same liberties and basic due processes which other Canadians, quote unquote non-Arab, non-Muslim, counterparts are afforded. It seems that their Arab or Muslim identity trumped their charter rights and freedoms. No pun intended. Um, another common theme seems to be that there was complicity on the part of the Canadian government in these people's cases. In one form or the other, the Canadian government and our law enforcement agencies seem to have played a role, sometimes an active role, in leading these individuals down the horrible nightmare that they they endured, whether through providing faulty intelligence data or actively, in the case of the five men held underneath security certificates, actively detaining these men. Of course, the last thing here is that none of these men were ever charged formally with any crime. There was never any substantial evidence tabled against them or at least produced for the public to see that would ever link them to terrorist activities. And not to be simplistic about this, but overall the only thing which these men seem to have been guilty of was being Muslim or of Middle Eastern descent. Um, I do want to make the point that the highest courts of this land and, and commissioned the public inquiries did eventually uh, clear many of these individuals of, of the crimes and they, our judicial system did come through at the end of the day in many of these instances, but Af only after years and years of horrible ordeal which these individuals had to go through, after their families were broken apart, after they suffered tr tremendous social and financial loss, they didn't act soon enough, or we didn't act soon enough in the case of these individuals. And 
That seems to be the theme with Hassan Diab's case as well. So the above examples raise the obvious question, I guess, of why? Why do individuals such as Hassan Diab and the other cases I have highlighted seem to exist within the spaces, spaces of exception, spaces where they aren't privy to the same legal protections and processes that others are afforded? And it seems to also raise the further question of why isn't there more of a public outcry over their treatment at the hands of our own government and law enforcement agencies, and at, the, at times at, our own, at the hands of our own judiciary system? And I think this is a complex question with a number of complex answers, which are political, legal, and social in nature, which all cannot be addressed in, in a 15-minute talk, and I don't have the expertise to do that. But the point that I do want to make is that our government, our law enforcement agencies, our intelligence agencies, our judiciary system, us as a whole, as a, as a Canadian public, we don't exist within a vacuum. We, there is a political and social climate or environment within which we exist. And since 9-11, as Dawn has pointed out as well, this climate has been one of increasing Islamophobia, or a climate within which there is a heightened fear or prejudice, sometimes hatred, and dislike towards Muslims. And we've seen it here in Canada. We saw it here in our last federal elections where um, a party that will go unnamed practically ran its entire campaign, at least in its dying days, uh, a campaign based on Islamophobia. It proposed something as ridiculous as a barbaric cultural practices hotline where you could report in on your Muslim neighbor. We saw it with Bill C-51, with the rhetoric that was used to try to justify this draconian piece of legislation, which is a law now. It was, we were constantly told that the biggest threat facing Canada right now is the threat of homegrown Muslim extremists. And we saw it recently, most recently and most tragically in, in Quebec with, with the shooting of six Muslim fathers, six Muslim men. But what I want to highlight in this case is that when it comes to Muslim men, and of course Muslims across all spectrums are affected by Islamophobia, especially Muslim women, but for this case in particular, I want to highlight how Muslim men, uh, in, through the lens of Islamophobia, take on a very particular form. Whereas they are stereotyped and presented in a very particular way by the media, and at times by the government through its rhetoric, these stereotypes or tropes paint a public imagery of Muslim or Middle Eastern men as being dangerous, religious extremists, militants, and ultimately as terrorists. I would argue that the public impact of these tropes or stereotypes of Muslim men in particular is that it creates a certain type of apathy or an even unspoken bias towards denying individuals such as Hassan Diab a due process based on the fact that individuals such as him are deemed to be guilty even before going to trial, based simply again on the fact of their descent or their background. In other words, for individuals of Middle Eastern or Muslim background who are suspected of terrorism, the presumption of innocence enshrined within the Charter that an individual is presumed to be innocent until proven guilty according to law in a fair public hearing is flipped on its head. For them, they are often presumed guilty until proven innocent in an unfair, biased hearing that is anything but public. So, I think that if we as Canadians really stand for the values of equality, diversity, and inclusiveness, and are actually dedicated to fighting this thing called Islamophobia within this country, I think one of the most meaningful ways to do that is to support Hassan Diab's case and to raise awareness about this injustice he is experiencing because there is a strong element of Islamophobia to it. Ultimately, I believe that it is vitally important to view Hassan Diab's case through a lens of Islamophobia or discrimination because we need to point out the lack of due process, but we also need to call out and deconstruct, deconstruct this climate and atmosphere of Islamophobia or anti-Muslim sentiment that has allowed for this injustice to happen in the first place. Because until we do that, until we challenge this overwhelming environment and climate of Islamophobia, there will continue 
to be Hasanbiyabs, it will continue to be Maharars, it will continue to be Omar Khadars, it will continue to be Abu Sufyan Abdul Razik's. And I think I'll, I'll leave it at that.